Hi, my name is Bill Riley, Grass and Forage Scientific Officer with AHDB Beef and Lamb, and this presentation is going to show you how to use the new recommended grass and clover list for 2017 and 2018, which is due to be released at this year's Grass and Muck event in Stoneley. So today I'm going to speak through the uh, recommended grass and clover list, both the, the handbook, which is very much farmer focused, and we also have the merchant copy, which is ideally suited for the breeders and the merchants. Uh, at this stage, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, the other partners in this project. We have the BGS, the BSPB, and HCC, or the, the Welsh Meat Levy Board. So both copies of the list um, are available on the AHDB website and also at britishgrassland.com forward slash RGCL. Um, so the plan is for today, we're going to have a brief run through the handbook and then go through the full list of the merchant copy. So as I've already stated, um, the British Grass and Society are involved in this project, the British Society of Plant Breeders are also involved, and the HCC, uh, and also ourselves at AHDB Beef and Lamb, and also our dairy colleagues. Uh, just to make you aware, the funding for this project changed in 2012, and that, that now means that data like this can be uh, published. So in order for any grass uh, to actually be sold in the UK, it actually needs to have passed national list trialling. And the recommended grass and clover list trials actually follow on from these uh, for an, an extended three year period. So in total it takes approximately six years for any grass to make it onto the recommended grass and clover list after a substantial period of, of breeding and going through national list trialling. And then again, before it's actually placed onto the recommended grass and clover list, it's presented in front of the crop committee board, and then they decide whether it has actually met the criteria or whether it is improving agricultural grasses for British farmers. It's only at this point that, this point that it is actually added to the, to the list. And it's worth noting that only 1 in 20 of the perennial rye grasses that are actually presented in front of the crop committee actually make it to full recommendation. So data for each uh, grass variety is actually collected at six sites across England and Wales. We have Nyab Tag and Tadcaster, Ibers and Aberystwyth, DSV in Wardington, DLF in Didbrook, and then Barrenbrug in Evesham, Nyab again in Dartington. And th the last two sites are actually disease sites, and the aim of this is to actually uh, encourage disease within their varieties to improve our overall accuracy of, of disease measurement or disease resistance within those plants. So as I've said, the recommended grass and clover list trialling actually lasts for three years. So in the first year of the of testing, grass is cut to simulate silage, and in the second year it is, uh, it is subjected to a simulated grazing management technique, and then again in the final year it is uh, taken under a conservation cut, to, again to simulate silage. So throughout these testing, uh, obviously, uh, quality is going to be measured as well as quantity that's actually produced from the from the trial plots. Um, D value is going to be is going to have a significant impact on on farmers' thoughts and uh, whether the farmer actually wants to to sow the variety in a, in the, as part of a new lay. And obviously, uh, from our point of view, we want to ensure that the trials are fairly similar to the conditions that the uh, grass might experience out on farm. So obviously, we want to try and keep it real to to what is actually going to be the, the conditions that the grass might be, uh, be put under on farm. So as I've already mentioned, we have both the handbook and the merchant list that we're going to speak through. Uh, for the minute, I'm going to speak through and focus on the handbook. Uh, within this, we have uh, a variety of, of uh, different things that we have to remember before we actually go about a reseed. So also included within this part of the of the handbook is a, a brief description on uh, tips for reseeding, but also a pasture improvement flow chart uh, on which we can actually assess the pasture and identify any fields or areas that might need uh, to be reconsidered for, for a reseed. So what we're going to do now is just move through the book. If we move to page 10, the intermediate perennial ryegrass varieties, we can note that uh, L grasses are actually listed depending on their ploidiness. Uh, obviously, the diploids and tetraploids are going to be assessed separately. And again, this is uh, they have both been put into their own individual charts on the within the booklet itself. 
So if we look at the list, uh, grasses are actually placed in the list depending on their heading date. So the earlier the heading date, the further up the list they are actually placed. So we can see here on the intermediate perennial ryegrass, diploid varieties, we can see the Solomon uh, heads out on around the 18th of May. And as you move further, further down towards the bottom of the list, the, we start to, to hit a later stage in the month. As I've said, the grasses are tested both in simulated grazing, and that's what we can see in the first column here. So the average uh, total annual yield, if we put that figure of uh, the average is 100, that equates to 10.34 tons of dry matter. So if we look further towards the bottom of the list, and we look across from the grass varieties that are that are being presented, if we look at Solomon at 99 that yielded just below average at 10.34 tonnes and as we get further towards the bottom of the list these figures can vary. It is worth noting though that grasses that are producing 99 uh, in, in terms of yield um, against the average that 1% isn't actually that much of a difference on farm scale it's just for the purpose of the recommended grass and clover list um, trials. So next on the list then is the conservation management data and this is year two of the three year trialing period for the recommended listed uh, trials. Um, so here we can see the uh, average yield again against the, the, the mean um, and again we also have D value. Following on from this we then have ground cover um, which is a measure of persistency within the, within the sward. And then moving on from this, we have the disease resistance um, for the perennial ryegrass varieties. So we have uh, crown rust and dreschler. And these are based on the 1 to 9 scale, with 1 being poor and 9 being good in terms of resistance. Moving on to page 14 of the uh, of the handbook, we have the Italian ryegrass varieties. And again, similarly, um, these have been broken up into their, depending on their ploidiness. So diploids and tetraploids, again, have been have been separated into their own, play, um, their own tables. And again, varieties are listed depending on heading date, with the earlier heading varieties being placed further towards the top of the list. Also listed is the average annual total yield, and again we're comparing this to the average at 100%, which is in this circumstances is 18.11 tons of dry matter per hectare. And again, we are com we are going up and down the list, and where we see above 100 is above the average figure of 18.11, and below is is below the average figure. Moving across the list again, we have D value for the second conservation cut, and we also have early spring growth a measurement and also uh, our first conservation cut and this is simply because of the, uh, the tendency for people using Italian rye grasses for uh, conservation and for early spring growth. Similarly again we're seeing a measurement for ground cover again it's measuring, measuring uh, persistency within the sward and also we have a disease measurement again based on the 1 to 9 scale so in this circumstances we have ryegrass uh, mosaic virus resistance and also a measurement for mildew resistance. On pages 16 and 17 we have a recommended list for hybrid ryegrass varieties and also we have a recommended list for the timothy species on page 17. Moving on to page 18 of the handbook, we can see a recommended list for white clover species. Um, it's, uh, it's quite different to the grass varieties in that the uh, it, the species are actually um, listed depending on their leaf area. So we can see here that Aberace has been listed at the top of the list and this is because of its leaf area which is a 378 and as we get further down the bottom towards the bottom of the list, leaf area begins to increase. As we move further towards uh, t towards the right of the of the screen, we're getting the total yield for the clover, and this is estimated or calculated in um, the third harvest year. So in this instance, we're looking at our average of 100 at uh, 4.03 tons of dry matter per hectare, and again, we're going uh, we're estimating yield um, compared to this. So where we have below 100 is below that that figure of 4.03, and above is obviously above the figure of 4.03. Um, next we have the total yield of grass and clover and this gives an, an, a, a yield or a measurement of how the grass and clover interact uh, in terms of, of yields within the sward. And then again as we get to the, to the right of the picture we can see a, 
a measurement for ground cover or persistency and um, if we look after light in terms of light defoliation this is estimating um, ground cover after uh, silage taking or cattle grazing and then again after hard defoliation this is uh, namely a, a sheep grazing session and again this is based on the 1 to 9 scale with 1 being poor and 9 being good so on page 19 we have the uh, descriptive list for red clover and it's just worth bearing in mind that the, the descriptive list is not actually the same as the list that we've been spoken about previous to this um, these just more so detail the uh, different varieties that are actually available uh, within England and Wales um, and they don't have the same um, rigor that um, that we've spoken about in the in the previous lists. It's worth bearing in mind that we do hope to have a recommended list for the red clover varieties in the next few years. If we look at the table, basically it works um, similar to the the list that we've spoken about previous to this. If we look at the table, we can see our average for the uh, yield at first cut is 5.26 tons of dry matter, and again above or below this. Um, is going to give us an indication as to whether the, the varieties listed are giving um, more or less of the uh, of the average at 100, which in this instance is 5.26 tonnes. Again, moving across the list, we have our annual yield and also a crude protein content and a measure of ground cover. Um, also, it's, it might be worth mentioning that we do hope to have a a recommended list for the red clover varieties in the next few years and at, at that point we will have a bit more rigor within uh, within these tables so we hope that the handbook is going to use uh, it's going to be used when f when farmers are looking to reseed the field um it's it's an a tool it's a tool to help um farmers and producers make decisions when they're selecting different varieties and um basically the first thing we have to consider is is the list or is the uh, is the variety actually on the list if it is, we have to identify whether it's actually suitable for what we ha hope to uh, to use the species for. Is it going to be grazed? Is it going to be is it going to be cut quite often? Um, and hopefully, by using this list, we can make more informed decisions as to whether a species or a variety of grass or clover might suit the system. So if we move on now to the full list or the, the merchant copy as it's often referred to. This basically gives us a more complete data set. It gives us more of a an in-depth look at at the performance of the the whether it be a grass or a clover within the recommended list trials. So the merchant copy has a bit more data on the uh, on how data is actually gathered for the recommended list um, trials and it also gives us some description of disease resistance um, throughout both England and Wales and it's also worth noting that similar to the handbook grasses are listed depending on the ploidians so tetrapoids and diploids have their own individual lists so if we move on to page 6 and take the uh, early perennial ryegrass as, a, as an example it's worth noting that we can see that the uh, grasses have actually been assigned a, 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 a letter and we had either have a GS, a PG or a PS um, underneath each of the varieties and basically this has given us an indication as to why the grass has been put onto the list depending on its um, its performance in the trials. So if a uh, grass is, dumb, is has been designated as a uh, as a G variety. It's known as a good all rounder in terms of performance. An S variety has been seen to be um, a good performer and, and and will be useful for a, a specific use. It's not as good as a G variety, but it's still been taught to uh, have enough. Um, credentials to, to actually be placed on the list for a specific reason and the PGs and PSs um, they have been provisionally placed on, on the list and will again be reviewed at a later stage when more data has been gathered um, in trials. Also within the uh, the merchant list were given more an indication of seasonal growth for grazing throughout the throughout the season, and also were given an indication in terms of uh, of yields for uh, under conservation. So again, this has given us more of an insight into how to how the grass um, performed uh, in the in the recommended list trials, and it's going to give us more of an indication or a better indication than what is actually available available to us in the uh, in the handbook. We're also given more of a, an in-depth analysis of how the uh, how the grass is actually performed in terms of agronomic features and also de disease resistance. So in this instance, on page seven, we're given a disease score for crown rust, dreschla, and mildew. 
Um, also beneath this, we're given uh, we're given the, uh, the the year that the grass was actually first listed. It details how long the grass has actually been placed on the list, and also we're given the the, the grass breeder and also the UK agent um, from where the grass uh, variety can actually been sourced from. Finally, we're also given the uh, the number of trials that the grasses have actually been subjected to um, in terms of yield production. So this is going to give us an indication as to how much data is actually behind the, the, the figures in front of us. So if we look at the intermediate perennial ryegrass tetraploid varieties, we're presented with the mean of the G varieties. And basically this is giving us the mean uh, performance for all the ryegrass that, ryegrasses that are listed within the recommended list. And then we're introduced to the uh, intermediate tetraploid mean and basically that's the mean of the table that is actually being presented in front of us. So as we can see here in terms of grazing yield Fintona is at 105 compared to 98 for Malone and 101 for Glenstall but if you go below this and we can see the seasonal growth early grazing yield for Glenstall is actually higher than that of Fintona. So this table actually allows us to see different attributes within the grass and enables us to make a more informed decision when we're choosing a uh, species that we're going to select for our new lay. So if we move on to the Italian ryegrass diploid varieties on page 16, we can see there's more of an emphasis on seasonal growth and also conservation. That's purely down to the, the nature of the, of the grasses and what their intended purpose is usually, is usually for. So again, we can see that we're presented with more information than that of the, of the handbook. And where we can see brackets within the, within the tables, that basically means that the data behind those figures is quite limited. Um, in terms of disease, that's why the two sites that I spoke about earlier on were set up to encourage disease within the, the varieties and make these, uh, make these figures more accurate. Looking at page 24, the white clover varieties, we can see that the white clovers are actually now being, um, being, being put on the, the table depending on the leaf size again, similar to the, to the handbook. But in this instance, they're actually going from, from left to right in terms of leaf, increasing leaf size. So if we look at Aberace, it's at 378. And as we get further towards the, the right of the table, the leaf size of the white clovers begin to, begin to increase. We're also given more information in terms of light defoliation uh, yields and um, also uh, yields and, and the third harvest. So this is going to give us more of an indication as to whether the uh, different clovers are going to be suitable for silage taking or for, um, or for a rotational grazing system. Similarly to the handbook, we also have a descriptive list for red clover and also for, Lucer for lucerne. Um, we are hoping, as I said, to have a recommended list for red clover in the coming years, and there is ongoing work to have that published. Um, we also have a recommended list for Timothy varieties, similar to the handbook. So the purpose of the recommended grass and clover list, whether it be the merchant copy that we just run through or the, hand the smaller handbook, is to enable farmers to make a more informed decision when performing a reseed um, and it's going to give them a more of an insight as to which grasses are going to suit the system. These are available to download at britishgrassland.com forward slash or at our own website at AHTB.